Welcome to a new episode of Latinos Who Tech, a podcast that explores Latinos at the intersection of technology, productivity, and authenticity. My name is Hugo Castellanos, and I work in Silicon Valley. Technology sometimes gets in the way of the things we want to get done instead of helping us. Oh, t- I totally, totally agree, which is why my, my notebook is still like my number one productivity tool. Yeah, well, I got one of these guys. So, <laughs> yeah, without it, I'm, I'm, I'm just useless. Yeah. That's awesome. So, tell me your story. How did you get to Mexico City? I mean, you grew up in California, but I'm curious of uh, how do you go about you know, your journey to uh, you know, becoming a digital nomad? Or uh, Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So, I'm curious to hear uh, how, how do you uh, get to be one? It's kind of a, a roller coaster pathway. Uh, I grew up in California and I'm third generation Mexican American. Um, and I grew up with a lot of identity struggles about, you know, feeling, you know, Chicana or Mexican or American or what. And where I grew up was a predominantly Latino neighborhood in Los Angeles called Wilmington. It's the southern part of Los Angeles where the port of LA is. And so I grew up in a neighborhood um, that was mostly um, immigrants and a lot of people from different Latino backgrounds, but mostly Mexican. And um, I grew up in that neighborhood. And when I was a kid, people would make fun of me for not speaking Spanish. And Mm. I understood it. And my grandparents would speak to me in Spanish and I would speak back in English. And that always caused me so much shame. Um, And then uh, when I was 10, we moved to a better neighborhood And it was predominantly white where I went to school. And then I had all this like shame about feeling Latina and like my family was very different. Like I still have culturally a very Latino family. Like I'm one of five kids and we're a big, loud family and all these things. And um, so I always had these kinds of like identity struggles. Um, And then when I was 18, I spent a summer in Mexico to learn Spanish. Um, And then over the years, I did a lot of traveling in Latin America and I felt like I could get around fine in Spanish, but I never felt like, like Spanish was native to me and that I could speak it like I speak English. And so it always had been a dream of mine to, to move to Mexico and really live here full time and embed myself and like learn the culture more. And uh, it's really interesting being here as a Mexican American because I see how American I am. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I also, you know, enjoy, um, I, I enjoy so much of the culture and learning more about it. And it's been really important for me to bring those elements back into me and my culture because my, my husband and I want to raise our kids speaking Spanish and Portuguese. So for mm. us, it's really important to feel connected to that culture. And I think for a lot of people whose families immigrate to the U.S., um, once you get to like third generation, it's hard to maintain the language and maintain the customs and all those things. And um, for my family who left Mexico in poverty and struggling, they're like, why do you want to be in Mexico? And they're always worried <laughs> about the crime and the violence and all those things. And for of me, course. I'm able to see the the amazing things about the culture that um, that are still a part of our re- resilience and a part of who we are. And it's been really important for me to connect with that. So that's, that's how I ended up here. And um, it was it was never a good time to just like quit my job and move to Mexico. And right. and last year I realized um, if I don't do this now, I'm going to have kids and I'll probably never go. So you made a conscious choice to change, uh, to change my work, to change everything, to make this happen. And um, because we're able to work remote and have our own business, like I left my full-time job to work with um, my husband on his company, Forte Labs. So it's worked out really easy for us to be here in in Mexico. And it also works out well because we have, um, you know, we have a lot of privilege being able to have choice to easily immigrate here. Mm -hmm. Like the visa process is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's it's an opportunity that we can take advantage of um, when, you know, for many people, that's not always the case. Um, But I'm glad Mm -hmm. it gives me a chance to, to connect with my roots. Because I know you went to school up here in the Bay. You know, what was your impression of living here, seeing this uh, 
very accelerated pace that we have here. Yeah, I spent my entire adult life pretty much in the Bay Area. I I went there when I was 17 for college. I went to Berkeley and it really felt like a culture shock coming from like suburban uh, Orange County, which is where I went to high school. And mm-hmm. so it was a really big difference to be in an environment where um, where there's a, there's so many people who are active in their community, who care about mm-hmm. what's going on in the world, um, who are super ambitious. Um, and I really liked that environment. And it was a good environment for me to become an adult. Uh, and then I, I stayed there over the years after I graduated. Um, I I moved back to LA for a year. Then I lived in Brazil for a year. Then I went back to really start my career in the Bay Area because I knew I had more opportunities there for what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I really enjoyed building a network there and building my career there. There's just really interesting people doing really amazing things. But by the time I hit my 30s, it was becoming a bit overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Um, just it's it's a rat race with so many people Definitely. working really hard and you know you're scheduling your friends like weeks in advance like two weeks from now can we hang out on Thursday and it's like all <laughs> that stuff and like I finally was at the point in my career where I I don't need to get furniture from Craigslist and um, and I have a 401k and like all that adult stuff and I was just kind of like is this it like is this mm-hmm. all my life is now like do I just work really hard and then retire and like I, I that idea was really scary for me and that's when I was like we need a change we need to get out of here we need a different like scenery because it was too comfortable. And when I get too comfortable, I feel like I'm not growing. And I knew it was Mm -hmm. time for something different. I knew Mexico would be a new challenge. I knew starting to work for myself would be a new challenge. And um, so I I needed a shift in the environment. And then realistically, I didn't see the Bay Area as the place for raising my family. Um, You know, my husband and I both have Latina moms. So if we try to raise kids, not not like near them, that wouldn't, that wouldn't yeah, go well. You, uh, yeah. You need to have like a hundred mile radius. Uh, you know, it's going to be a quick drive away at least. <laughs> exactly. And I, I like, like my abuela like took care of me when I was a kid. So I have like the same expectation of my mom, like being there to help me with, with kids. So it seemed like a good time to leave the Bay area, go experience Mexico, Mexico for a little bit. And then, um, and then settle down in Southern California, which is where, um, where our families are and, you know, be able to raise our kids, uh, by, by our families. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I, I completely relate. Uh, you know, I've been in the Bay for five years. Uh, I've lived in the U S for, for 20 years. So uh, I straddle this identity of I'm, I'm Venezuelan, but I'm also American. Uh, so I, I just came up with this brand for myself. I, I'm gringo Solano. Because uh, <laughs> uh, when I hang out with my uh, friends from the U.S., you know, I'm the loud Latino one. And then when I hang out with my friends uh, from Venezuela, from Colombia, they say that I'm I'm too gringo, like I'm too organized. Too, uh, so it's just, uh, you know, it's that, again, you kind of just embrace it, right? That uh, you are this uh, third, third culture kid. What I love about California is just the, the diversity. I mean, that's uh, that's what keeps me here. Um, also how people are very, um, passionate about what they're working on. Um, and then from outside, they may seem like they're workaholics, but then you dig a bit, a bit deeper on the, Hey, what are you trying to build? What are you doing at your company, at your business? And, uh, you find that there's this connection with their values and what they're trying to build. So, so I'm wondering if you can share with me, like, uh, what are your, your values? You know, how do you align these, uh, okay, I'm going to quit my job. Uh, work on my own business, my family business, my digital business, and uh, just uh, move forward. So how do you align that with your, your values? I think that's a really great question. Um, I think for me, a value I have, and it's a privilege to have this value because I, you know, I, I had generations of people before me who sacrificed a lot so I could be in an opportunity where I have choice and I'm able to define what I want to do based on what makes me happy. And this is, you know, I'm the first generation of my family to do that. Whereas like previous people, 
Um, they had to do what they had to do to survive. And I constantly remind myself that that is, that is a privilege. And it's always been a huge value of mine to really go after um, what I care about and make that center to what I do and not not take jobs just to have a job or just to have a paycheck, but really for it to be something that sustains me emotionally and mentally and spiritually. And I've been lucky enough to do that um, because my parents really encouraged me to do that. Um, When I was growing up, they really gave me so much freedom to explore whatever it is I was interested in. And um, I didn't see how valuable that was till I was in college and I met people whose parents just like controlled and dictated their whole lives and told them what they had to study yeah, and what the, they had to do. And yeah, the tiger moms, tiger dads, yeah. Yeah, like I had a roommate who would be on the phone with her dad while she was like picking out her course schedule. And I was like, I don't know if my parents oh, know wow. what my major is. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. like my parents always just trusted me to to do what I wanted to do and supported me. Um, so when I was young, um, it was like supporting me in the arts, like doing lots of dance and acting and um, drawing and painting. And they really just gave me that space to do it. Even if financially we couldn't afford these things, they like found ways to make things happen um, and, and give us those opportunities and that space. And so I felt like I always had a good center of like what I like and what I dislike. And I was able to hold that as a value moving into work. And what I discovered in college um, was just a really deep passion for social justice and racial justice. And I, I went to high school in a place that was, you know, a good school, a good neighborhood, um, where I, I mentioned earlier, um, it was predominantly white. And it wasn't until mm-hmm. I was in college and starting to study like ethnic studies and stuff that I realized the the huge inequities compared to the neighborhood I grew up in um, before moving there that was all Latino, heavily polluted, high violence, poor schools. It was just like a it was a neighborhood that didn't create opportunities, which is why my family wanted to leave. And it took three generations for my family to be able to have the opportunity to leave. And many families don't have that opportunity. Um, and it was then that I really put forward like my, my top value in the work I do, which is, which is social justice and creating more opportunities for all people to have a lifestyle where they're able to go after the things they care about in life and really do and achieve what they're capable of without the structural barriers that stop that from happening. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I, yeah, you know, that, that alignment, uh, once you find that alignment, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to let go. It's, uh, it's definitely something that I, I wish everybody had the, the time and the, the, the focus, right. To actually go through that exercise of, uh, okay, uh, what am I really good at? Uh, what do I value? Then, uh, you know, what's the opportunity in the world? I was just going to add that, um, this this privilege to really discover your passions i feel like the latino culture is very supportive of this i've lived with different family members throughout my whole life and i, I like to think of it as like the latino like welfare system <laughs> is that like within <laughs> families we are super supportive of each other like between oh, yeah. you know not just your siblings but your your tios like it's it's something that I think not everyone has. Like I, I never had a question of like where to stay or where to eat. Like there's always someone to take me in throughout my career. Like when I first moved back to the Bay area after, after leaving um, Brazil, I just, I called up my, uh, my madrina and I was like, Hey, I want to move in with you while I'm looking for jobs. And she was like, okay, what day do you get here? And you know, it's like, not a, like, <laughs> we're not like, might be weird. Yeah. For other people. yeah. It's, like, it's, it's not an if it's a when. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I lived with her for eight months while I, like, I, I found a job that paid me like not that much, but it was a it was a huge opportunity and learning opportunity. And I paid her no rent. She fed me all my food. And like, um, she she didn't live in San Francisco. So I had a long commute, but it was, 
it was a good opportunity for me to be able to explore my passions. And I don't think I would have been able to do that if I had to, um, if I had to um, work really hard to just support myself with rent. And then additionally, like our families being very communal are that like, people give and take within the family. So when I was, you know, new to my career, my sister was working like two jobs and she was supporting the family a lot. And then when she uh, went to do her teaching credential at that point, I was working full time and then I was able to help support the family and uh, like with my mom and my siblings and everything. Um, And so we have that expectation of like, sometimes you receive and sometimes you give and it's based on um, the family unit as a whole, rather than just like you as an individual, because we see one person's success as everyone's success. Definitely. Definitely. And um, in my specific case, you know, I'm, Again, uh, everybody knows that, you know, Venezuela is going through a, you know, there's a humanitarian crisis right now. And uh, what I've seen is that a lot of the people that have uh, emigrated outside the country and they've gone to the U.S., to Spain, to Mexico, to Argentina, to Australia, um, technology is a huge part of it. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I have uh, like five family groups in WhatsApp that I talk to. So I have a group for my sisters, a group for like all the cousins, a group where it's all the cousins with grandma. So we make <laughs> sure that, you know, we, 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 we watch out what we say in that group. Um, so it's, a uh, and we couldn't, and again, it's a uh, part of having that, uh, support system. Yeah, definitely. I have plenty of those WhatsApp groups too. And, um, I think originally, like the idea of like when I first moved to the Bay Area of not coming back to be with my family felt like I I think originally I was like, oh, I could never do that. I have to live by my family. Um, But with technology, it it becomes very easy to stay up to date 24 seven. I talk to I have I have three sisters and a brother and my three sisters. I probably talk to at least one of them every day. Um, on the phone, and in addition to all of our group messages and apps and all those things, and uh, it's it's easier to stay connected. And my my sister is only a year younger than me. Sometimes we just leave our our video chats just on while we do nothing. <laughs> like we just walk around the house, <laughs> and whatever, and chime in every once in a while. Like it's like we're in the same room. Oh, that, that, that's amazing. Um, and something funny enough, uh, and, and I definitely, I want us to touch on the uh, building a second brain and all the great work that, that you've been doing with Forge Labs. Uh, something that it has helped me with is that, you know, like everybody has different communication styles. Uh, I'm, I'm very informal, uh, but, and again, like I prefer to, to talk on the phone or FaceTime with people. Like I, I I'm, I'm that weird person that actually enjoys FaceTiming people. Uh, but then I have uh, friends and family that, you know, they, they prefer to text. And, and that's fine. Uh, and then sometimes I find something interesting I want to share with them, like an idea or even maybe a meme. But I just want to show you like a funny meme that I found that reminded me of you. Uh, but again, it's three in the morning over there. So <laughs> I don't want to send it right now because, again, if you, if you turn off your phone before bed like I do, uh, you know, again, I want to be respectful of, uh, I don't want to disrupt you with, with things like that. So what I do is that now I have a, I actually have an Evernote notebook where I keep all the stuff that I want to share uh, <laughs> at some point. And then like, uh, like inspirational or funny. Uh, and, uh, and it just helped me, you know, when I want to, uh, oh, I haven't talked to so-and-so in a while. How do I start the conversation? Oh yeah. Let me send, send him this funny meme that, hey, this reminded me of you. Uh, so, so again, it's a way of, um, I look at these organizational systems, these tools, uh, again, it's not only for work, right? It's also for whatever you want to do with them, mm-hmm. uh, like relationship building. Uh, it's not only to make uh, PowerPoint slides or analyzing data. It, it's not for like heavy stuff only. It can be also for, uh, again, are you... Um, managing your relationships effectively. So it's, uh, that's what I love about the, the building a second brain uh, system, the para system, the fact that it's, uh, it's agnostic. Uh, mm-hmm. I could, uh, I'm a, a working tech, I'm an engineer, and, and I use it. It works for me. 
uh, if I'm a stand-up comedian, I could use it too. Uh, so I really love that about the, the work you do and the, the work that uh, Tiago has been working on. So you know, thank you. Thank you for doing all the great stuff you do. You're welcome. And it, yeah, it's interesting to see all the different ways people use the system because I would never think of that to just, um, you know, save things I want to save to send to people. But something I do put down a lot is I record a lot of just like hilarious, funny things my family members say. Uh, mm -hmm. So like I used to, when I was a kid, I used to have a notebook where I would write down just like something hilarious my grandma said or my mom said or whatever. Um, Cause my family, they make me laugh harder than anyone. And uh, <laughs> now I put those all in Evernote. When someone says something that just like dies, like we like, die laughing. Um, I put those down and we have that kind of family where we're like, remember that time? And then some like we retell the same stories all the time. And so I have those like pretty well tracked in my, in my Evernote of like hilarious family things. Um, and then something else I've recently started doing, especially as, as, um, you know, mis abuelos are getting older and I, I start really trying to capture their stories and really mm -hmm. understand my ancestors. And so anytime I'm, I'm talking, um, with a family member and they just tell like a really touching story or like something I didn't know about my parents or whatever, I put that down into Evernote. And so I have a folder called like ancestor history and I just try to capture awesome. as much in there as possible. And, um, one of my grandmas has a cousin who's just like this documentarian of the family. And I sat down with him one day and he sent, he showed me just like all these pictures and told me all these stories going back to like his, his grandma, who would be my, my great, great, great grandma. Um, and, uh, that, and he remembered her from his childhood. And I just like wrote that all down. And I don't know if I'll ever do something with that, but I, I have it saved somewhere yeah. in case one day I want to use that information and, and package it into something like a, like a family uh, photo book or something like that. Got it. Yeah. No, it's having that peace of mind that, uh, Hey, I, maybe I don't have the time to do anything with it. I don't know if I want to do something with it. I have it in my someday, maybe, but I have it. And, uh, and again, maybe I, I and, and again, it's the opportunity, right? Cause uh, I have a, I have a note with all the movies I want to watch with my girlfriend. And, uh, and she's, uh, she's from Brazil. And sometimes I find a really cool movie that I want to watch with her, a documentary about she's from the South of Brazil and I want to watch it with her. And uh, maybe it's Tuesday morning and I'm at work and I can't do that right now. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. So just, I save it. And then the next time we're together, Hey, what should we watch on Netflix? I don't know. Let me look at my Evernote. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this one that I thought about on Tuesday. Let's watch that one. Yeah, let's watch it. So it's just yeah. uh, how it makes a, all the little things in life a little bit easier. Um, so maybe you can, can you give me a walk me through um, what are you guys uh, trying to build? What problems are you trying to address? And maybe who is it for? Yeah, definitely. So our our main product is this building a second brain methodology, which we teach in a course. We also have a lot of written materials on it. Um, Tiago is working on a book on the methodology right now to make it more accessible. And, and the concept is really being able to systematically document and archive your brain in an, in an external source that you can tap into and um, access when you need that information. Uh, I imagine it like the Harry Potter, like pensive, um, yeah. where Dumbledore like extracts his thoughts and then he can go back and look at the, the pensive and, and, and look for his memories and, and relive them. That's how I imagine it. And a lot of people have these tools already like Evernote and task managers and notebooks. And there's a zillion programs nowadays, but they don't have a way for systematically getting that information into those tools and then getting that information out for when they need it. So they, they might like put a bunch of stuff in random places and then they can't find it. And then they don't know what they have where. So they, they can't get that information out for action. And so the process we teach in our course is a step by step step system for first being able to capture all the information that's important for you to capture. 
And then the second thing is how to organize that information for action. So not organizing it just to organize it. Like we don't want you to spend all day like making little folders and perfecting like a million tags and all that stuff. Like we don't want people to do that. We want you to organize your information just enough so that it's helpful for you to achieve the thing you're trying to do, the action you're trying to take, the thing you're trying to create. So that when you sit down to actually take those actions, you have all the buildup material necessary to be able to execute on that thing. And so what we find from people in our courses is once they have that system in place, creativity and executing is far easier because they've already done a lot of pre-thinking um, over a long period of time. So it makes it simple to just sit down and get to work. So they're, they're more productive once they're able to do that. Yeah, and thank you for walking us through that. Uh, I like to think of it, um, and again, uh, my family is huge in cooking and uh, again, getting together on a Saturday to barbecue, like that's uh, that's huge for us, you know, making time for those family occasions. And I love to think of it as uh, the idea of preparing for a, a barbecue, a cookout, is that you need to have all the things in place uh, before you can start cooking. You need to have your meat, your marinade, that you hopefully prep the day before. Uh, you need to have uh, all the sides that you want to make, all the utensils. Uh, you need to have everything in one place before you can start getting to work. Uh, and knowing that, you, trusting that you have everything you need to cook whatever you want to make, uh, it, it's, uh, it's very um, liberating uh, because you can relax, you can enjoy the moment. It's not the whole, uh, mijo, eh, we're missing garlic. Can you go run to the store and get some, <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, it's uh, I like to think of it that way. Um, the fact that I know that it doesn't matter if my inbox is uh, at 300. What I need to do, what the things I need to do, it's there. So I can search it. Uh, exactly. So, so um, in the video that I saw that I'm going to put in the show notes of the, the building a second brain with Notion class, you really you had a really interesting story uh, of, uh, you know, sometimes you're procrastinating, building all these tags and all these folders but in reality, what you need to do and what you know you need to do is make that phone call that you've been procrastinating on for the last few days. So no, that's, uh, that's why I reached out to you. And I thought that uh, uh, I was hoping that you could elaborate on, um, it, you know, when you plan your week, your day, your month, your quarter, um, what is it supposed to work? And then what really works for you? I'm, I'm curious to hear uh, how do you go about uh, planning your week uh, that, that that's something that uh, a lot of people that listen to this content are are curious on uh yeah definitely so what we teach in our in our classes are systems and methods. And I would say that um, Tiago's system is kind of like the best case scenario, really perfect, really robust system. And (laughs) mine is like the MVP, like the minimum viable product of what a system needs to be for me to get stuff done. And uh, I tried really hard at first to make this perfect system and to do it exactly like, you know, David Allen recommends and Mm -hmm. getting things done and then trying to perfectly follow Tiago's system. And I I just kept having breakdowns. It was really hard for me to stay um, up to date with like getting all my tags right and um, being able to perfectly place everything in my task manager and getting through all of it and finding stuff that was like unnatural for me because the way I work is actually a lot more based on my intuition and my feelings and communicating with people and being around people than relying on a computer to tell me what I need to do. And um, these systems have been tremendously helpful for me, but I, I had to, design the system that was going to be sustainable for me to maintain. And I think that's something that people really struggle with in our courses and in our coaching that we really have to get across to people that the, 
that you have to design a system that's going to work for you. We're giving you all these options. We're showing you a pathway. We're telling you steps, but it's a prototype and you have to prototype that system and find what's working for you. And my number one productivity principle is what is simple is sustainable and what is pleasurable is motivating. So if something becomes so complex that you can't maintain this, maintain it, and this is something I see with tags, like people will have like a hundred tags, they have different capitalizations, they can't find anything in the right tag because they've used too many of them and uh, they have that kind of thing. So I tell people like, you have five tag limit, like that's it, because that's what your brain can hold on to and remember. So trying to always make it more simple so you can sustain the system. And then the other thing, like it should be fun. Um, Mm -hmm. Like I have fun when I'm going through my daily and my weekly and my monthly review, but it used to not be fun. I had to create and find what worked for me and some things that felt too tedious, I just had to get rid of it. I'm like, this is taking me forever and I'm not getting that much value out of it. So I'm just going to eliminate it, like tracking my habits. I was trying to be like really diligent at tracking my habits and seeing how much I meditated. And I just, I would forget to do it. The data wasn't good. The data also didn't help me be better at doing my habits. So I was just kind of like, why am I wasting my time trying to track all this stuff? Let me just stop. But then there's people who love that. Like the, the quantified self people, they love that stuff. That gives them so much pleasure to track and measure Mm -hmm. those things and do those experiments. So they should do that because that gives them pleasure. And so you have to find that balance of what is simple enough for you to sustain and maintain. And then what actually brings you joy when you're doing it, you need to make sure those elements are in your system as well so that you can keep it going. A hundred percent. Yeah. Keeping it simple. It's, uh, it, it's paramount. Uh, because again, you have the OCD people uh, like me, I'll raise my hand proudly up and high uh, because, uh, and again, you have this, I have this engineering mentality, right? That uh, everything's got to work and it's got to be in order and uh, feelings. What are those? No, 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 no. It's, uh, this is technical. Uh, so, and again, it, it's, uh, and again, this, this was probably me like uh, four or five years ago. And now I realized that, Hey, you know what? Like maybe today I should focus on this thing. Because, again, it's Friday, so maybe people are not going to be as focused on shipping stuff. Maybe Friday is better to be a relationship building day. Let's uh, ping people for coffee or, a, you know, again, focus on different things. Uh, and, again, I, I love how you mentioned that, again, having that system uh, instead of, uh, again, because intuitively we all know that we got to organize our work. We all got to. Uh, write down stuff like intuitively we know that again maybe i should make folders in my email but what i love about the the second brain system is that you lay everything out and people can and actually i went through the not the second brain course i went through the get stuff done like a boss course that uh, tiago made and uh that that really 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 helped me uh, uh streamline my system uh, because again, I know that I'm supposed to be more productive with these systems. I read the David Allen book. I went to all these uh, OmniFocus webinars and like learning about tools and stuff. But uh, what I love about the that class that I took from Tiago was that uh, it gave me laser focus, and it's uh, 90 minutes long. So I watched the whole thing twice, and okay. I think I really got it now. And uh, uh, no, again, super thankful, super thankful that, uh, that I, I was able to find your, your content. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think um, something, something I struggled with when I first started doing this work is that I was always a very disorganized person. Like I come from a super disorganized family. Like anyone who's ever tried to hang out with my family, like they're like, what, what about next week? Can we make plans? I'm like, I can't let you know till day of because other plans might come up with my family. It's just like, no one could ever plan anything in advance. You right. have to be like super spontaneous and ready for anything. Like my mom would be like, we're driving to Las Vegas tomorrow to visit grandma. Everyone cancel your plans. And it was just, that's how I grew up in that like total, total right. chaos. Um, and you know, there's some benefit to being able to work well in that. 
Um, but it's also, it's stressful and it's not the best way to do and achieve things. And um, I made it through college with writing things down on my hand. And then um, my best <laughs> friend was super, super organized. And she would take, we were in all the same classes and she would remind me like, Lauren, remember this is due next week. And I'd be like, oh, okay. Um, like I was such a disaster. Um, and, but I, I just thought like, well, I've made it this far. Like I graduated from Berkeley. Like so I'm not a total yeah. disaster. Um, exactly. And then um, I got my first job. And when you have a job, it's like all of a sudden you have a limited number of hours in which you have to produce things. And I was managing a small nonprofit where I was the only full-time person. And so it was a ton of project management. There was so many different things happening. Like I was super stressed out. I was, so many things were falling in the cracks. And that was when I met um, Tiago and we started dating and he recommended I read Getting Things Done, um, which I read. <laughs> really? I, yeah. Is, 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 I, is that like a first date conversation? Like, hey, by the way, here's this productivity guru that you check out. Uh, <laughs> great first date. Probably, yeah, it actually, it, it was really funny. I saw it as like a sign from the universe that we were meant to be because it was maybe like the first or second week we had like met each other and we went on like one date and he recommended this book. And then that book just happened to be in the back of the cabinet of my office. And I was like, this is a ah, sign. <laughs> like, okay, um, okay. And uh, so I read that book and then this was before he developed his course or anything. And he really helped me get on top of... Um, my work system. Like he sat down with me one day and we went through, like I used a sauna at that job and we just mm -hmm. went through and we set it up with a GTD system. And so I was kind of like his first test case. And um, that allowed me to like be, be so productive and on top of things that in my last job, I was project managing a huge $20 million project in six cities. We had dozens and dozens of partners and my boss called me the operating control center. Like everyone was like, Lori oh. knows what happened, knows what happened. She's on top of it. She knows where everything is. And, um, when I tell people that I'm naturally very disorganized, they like, don't believe me. They think I'm like the most organized person they know. And I'm like, no, I'm like, I'm pretty much a mess, but I know how to be organized on the right. things that are important. Um, and uh, it's interesting now working with, um, working with Tiago on, on training and coaching and all these things related to productivity, because I have a better time grasping the mentality of where people are at when they're really struggling with these systems. Whereas for people who thinking this way comes naturally, like for Tiago or people who think in terms of systems and structures and buckets, it's like, oh, it makes total sense. But if it's unnatural for you to think this way, I have a better understanding of like what barriers you are going to face in being able to move forward in, uh, in, in a new system for how to work. Uh, so Tiago and I really balance each other out in that, in our, in our work. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, I, I've had a couple, um, I had a few uh, couples that are entrepreneurs in my, in my Spanish language podcast, Conexiones. Uh, I haven't done so in Latinos to Tech yet, uh, but, but I'm curious on how do you navigate this uh, work-life harmony? Uh, I, I, I guess that it's easier for you because uh, both of you, because you own your own business and, you, and it's all digital, right? Uh, so I'm curious at, at how do you know that... Uh, Okay, mi amor, it's time to stop talking about work. Uh, let's watch a movie. Let's go for a walk. Like, how do you navigate that? I'm curious if, if you don't mind sharing. Oh, yeah, that's we've had our ups and downs over the years. And um, we've we've learned how to manage. Um, but when Tiago first started this business, it was seven years ago. And um, I was about to start grad school um, and Tiago was just, he just said, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to see how long I can go without having to get another job. And that was, that was his goal at the time. And, uh, I started grad school and as he was getting things up and running, um, he wasn't able to really hire anyone. And so he, he was working really hard on his business and I would just, be the ears and the eyes around what was happening and give him my insights and feedback as any, as any good partner does. Um, and, uh, I would help him a lot because I had a really good understanding of, of what he was working on. And so 
I would just pitch in when he needed an extra set of hands, but you know, couldn't hire anyone. And so when I was in grad school, he started doing um, consulting trainings for really big companies uh, like Genentech, the pharmaceutical company, mm-hmm. uh, the Inter-American Development Bank um, in DC. And these were really big all day trainings. And um, my natural skill is teaching and facilitating. Like that's where my my Latina like personality really comes out mm-hmm. is being with groups of people and being able right. to navigate lots of conversations happening at the same time and all of that. And so it, it was just like a natural fit for me to help out on those projects. And so because I was in grad school, it was easy for me to just jump in on a project, fly to DC with him for a week to work on uh, a training and then come back. And so I, I was doing that over the years for many years, just kind of pitching in where, where he needed support. Um, and we had lots of tough times. So I'd say probably over the five years, at least once a year, we would say, let's never work together again. <laughs> like we'd say, it's not, <laughs> it's not worth it. Like it's not worth our yeah. relationship to, um, to do this to ourselves where we get really frustrated with each other. And, um, but over the years, we've also become a lot better at communicating with each other. Like we've done, uh, self-development courses and communication courses where we are like so good at getting to like exactly what we mean and how we feel rather than dancing around it. And, uh, we, we found out very quickly that one of our struggles is that, um, we both like to be in control and we both mm. don't like to have someone else tell us what to do. And so that was one of the struggles um, I first had when, when working with Tiago is like when he would try to tell me how to do it his way, that would be really frustrating for me. And similarly, um, uh, he would be afraid to tell me what he really thought or tell me his real expectation and then be disappointed, disappointed with, what I did when it wasn't what he expected, Mm. when he never clarified what his expectation was. And so we would kind of get into this vicious cycle where I was like, (laughs) you realize everything you've told me leading up to this, you said, this is great. This looks good. Oh my God. I love this. Like not once did you Mm -hmm. ever say do something different. And now you're saying you wish it was like X, Y, and Z. And so we just had to get a lot better at, at saying exactly what we feel and mean. And right. when we first did a, uh, a communication course together, you know, we learned about our communication styles. And in, in the past, if he would say anything that was criticism of me, I would just like melt down. I would like cry. Mm. I would yell. Like there could be a really big backlash for any type of criticism in any sort of way related to anything in our relationship whatsoever. So he learned to avoid ever giving me like real feedback. And in these Mm -hmm. communication courses, um, he learned how to, how to speak what he was feeling. And I had to learn how to hear and receive that and know that it didn't mean like, we're going to break up or I'm a terrible person Mm -hmm. or whatever, but it's just, it is what it is. And so we had to learn how to communicate in a way where we can both hear and understand each other. So that was like the, the biggest thing for being able to work well together. And then I'd say the second thing um, was really separating our domains and our our areas of expertise and um, Tiago giving me the trust to run certain aspects um, without having to like work super closely with him. And so the way we've done that is when we have training consulting or coaching projects, I am the lead on those projects. And he loves that because it's my strengths. And it's the stuff that he doesn't, that he's not super passionate about doing. Like he does not, he doesn't want to be on calls, like talking through all the details of someone's like situation. Mm -hmm. He likes it to some extent, but for me, I love that stuff. Like I love doing coaching calls. I'm like, let's problem solve. Um, I, I love the facilitating and the training. And so he lets me take the lead on that. Um, and that way he has the space and energy to focus on his passion, which is all the online teaching, the online courses and writing. Um, and, and we've been able to find that division of labor and, uh, and, and I'm happy that we're at the point where he trusts me to lead and run that stuff because, 
you know, a couple years ago, I felt like he didn't trust me. And then it would make me have a hard time, like moving forward and putting forward my own leadership and my own vision. And so now he lets me do things my way. And he knows that it will, it will arise, maybe not in the way he would have done it, but it still gets done. And so we've, we've learned to find that balance with each other that's worked really well, but it's taken uh, seven years to do that. So it's, it's, it's ups and downs. And I'm really happy we've worked through it because your, um, your, you know, your partner in life is someone who tends to balance you out, you know, in terms of like your energy and Mm -hmm. your strengths and your weaknesses and all those things. And you know, each other's businesses and you, you know, each other's like thinking so well that it, it, works really well when you are able to work together um, and make something happen together. Um, But I know a lot of people feel really afraid of attempting Mm -hmm. it. Um, And then, you know, you can very quickly get caught in the struggles and decide it's not for us. Um, But I'm glad we kind of moved through those spaces to get to where we are now. No, I mean, thank you for being so open about that. And, uh, and again, just looking back at the, Again, or uh, again, just the story that we have that uh, uh, mom and pop businesses have been going at, uh, since the beginning of time, uh, you know, like, uh, so when we switch over to this digital economy and this idea that, hey, I can actually make a living of making online courses and creating content. Uh, how do we take all those ideas, all the, those communication methodologies that have been happening since, again, the beginning of time, uh, since uh, uh, people have been launching businesses as a family, and how can we translate those to the modern reality uh, that we have? So uh, I think there's an opportunity there uh, you know, for, for people like you that have, uh, again, figured out what works, what doesn't work. Uh, I think there's an opportunity there you know, for making more, more content on, on that. Uh, yeah, is there, definitely. is there anything, is there anything else on second brain that you wanted to, to mention? Um, yeah, we have our upcoming live cohort starting April 6th. So twice a year we offer the course live and it's a really amazing community. Generally there's 200 people in the course and the people in the course watching it live are super interesting people um, doing really amazing things in the world. I mean, the the kind of people who pay for a product on how to be more organized and effective in, in your life, it's a very small niche. So it's, it's likely you will have a ton in common with those people if you are into that kind of stuff. Um, and so we love when we get to do this course live um, and see how people are going through it at the same time. We've previously had a self-paced version of the course, but we're actually going to start to start to rely more on these live cohorts because the benefits are so great of people being able to to share what they're going through and um, you know any barriers they might be coming across and be able to get support in a community. And uh, the Building a Second Brain community is so strong. Like Tiago and I just traveled um, to, I believe, six or eight cities over the past like six months. And in every single city, we did a um, a building a second brain meetup or a Forte Labs meetup where we were able to find people in like Kuala Lumpur or <laughs> New York, you know, um, who were yeah. interested in this kind of stuff. And um, it's a very unique group of people. And like, you know, even when we're in like the Philippines, it was just amazing meeting people who just like, they they're in our world in our environment so like we're we're all name dropping apps and methods and and books we read and like everyone is talking about the same stuff and i was like wow we can be like culturally so different but if you're in right. this little like kind of tech bubble then then the the world is really similar across all those places mm-hmm. because we are connected digitally um so it's a really great community to join. And we just hear so many great things from people who take this course and say that it it's completely changed their lives mm-hmm. because it's taken something that's been really hard for them to do. And it makes it simple and easy so that they can actually focus on 
putting out their work into the world. And um, that's what makes us really excited teaching this course. And it's, um, it's, uh, it's, I, I actually can't remember if it's four or six weeks, but it's somewhere, it's either four weeks or it's, six uh, weeks I think long. It's, uh, I think it's 35 days. Uh, like okay. uh, from 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 beginning to end, so it's like a four week again, like four weekish. Uh, I, I'd say, uh, but 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 I like what you said, a hundred percent. That uh, I find that all these online learning uh, activities, all these courses, all this content that we have, uh, is fantastic. But again, having that accountability that you have people that are meeting via Zoom and actually. Again, making sure that you're attending the, you're going to the classes, you're actually doing the work, uh, you're reviewing each other's systems, keeping each other accountable. That's a that's a force multiplier right there. Uh, because again, if you, if you just buy an online course and you take it, great. But I hate to see when people, and again, I've been guilty of this. Again, I don't I don't want to virtue signal. I've been guilty of this. That sometimes I buy something because it sounds really cool. Uh, but again, I probably take a couple months to look at it down the road. So having that quick accountability setup, I think that's really valuable. That's something that uh, helps this score stand out. Yeah, um, that's definitely the case with online education. And we really believe in online education and its future potential. And a lot of online ca- uh, education is switching to be more community centric and community based. And that really is the key to people being successful with online courses. And so, you know, the previous models of online courses like MOOCs, like they're, they have like a, a 98% rate of people not completing the course. Even Mm -hmm. when you have free courses from, you know, MIT and Harvard and all these things, people aren't taking the time to sit down and actually go through those courses because if there's no accountability, if there's no tangible goal or outcome you are trying to achieve, then it's really hard to be self-motivated to come home from work and to like put on your computer and, you know, teach yourself things. Um, and the, the, one of the best teaching tools for if you just want to learn how to do something is YouTube. Most mm-hmm. people yes. are learning. If, if you want to learn something quickly, like, let me, I, I do like woodworking. So I like, I always watch YouTube videos on like exactly <laughs> the, the skill set I'm trying to do while I'm, while I'm making something. Um, and that's great for that. And then, um, and then we have, you know, the model of premium courses where you're part of a community and you're learning together with people. When you get stuck, there is feedback on how to get over that hump. You're meeting interesting people. Um, you're learning in community. And like when you see other people and what they're doing and they're achieving, it inspires you to like apply some of those things to yourself. Um, and so it really is. Is, um, I think the key of online education is having that built-in community and accountability to actually get you to the finish line and achieving what you're there for. That's awesome. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I only have one more question. Uh, do you have a hard stop? I, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, no. Uh, no. Thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering, looking back at all the things that you've done uh, with your partner, your husband, your experience of, again, coming to the Bay, gaining skills, then choosing to go nomad. Um, What would you do differently if you could do it again? Um, What advice do you have for people that are in the fence on pulling that trigger of, hey, I have this idea, I want to execute it, um, what would you do differently if you could do it again? Hmm. I, I'm a big believer in all of my past experiences and past decisions being necessary to mm-hmm. get me to where I'm at today. So I think I was, I was super slow at a lot of things, but that was what I needed to be able mm-hmm. to come to the realizations um, that I had and be able to make the choices that I made. Um, but w- with that said, like, I'll just caveat that um, just to speculate. Um, I think something that I wish I like, if I was to do something different, um, I wish that I learned how to ask for help earlier in life. Like I used to be really terrified of asking for help and 
Um, I was never vulnerable. Like I was so focused on having to be perfect all the time. And I was just like a complete stress bomb. Like I was such a stress case when I was young. And I actually, I work with a lot of young people um, in another online course I, I teach called Win a Fulbright, where I help people apply for Fulbright scholarships. Um, and then I uh, and then I have a YouTube channel where it's all about like how to apply for jobs and how to um, apply for grad school, that kind of stuff. Um, and part of my inspiration for doing that is that like, I don't think I had enough guidance on those things when I was young. And so it took me a really long time to figure out how to do that stuff because I didn't have parents that went to college. I didn't have people um, in my family who can like help me with those kinds of things. Um, like I didn't have that, that social network um, to help in those ways. And, um, you know, later in life, I found really awesome mentors who really helped me do and achieve things. And most of those mentors were also, um, people of color and they found that it was really important, you know, to support other young people of color and figuring things, figuring these things out. And that's a lot of what I care about doing now is helping other young people like have a shortcut to, doing and achieving the things they care about rather than feeling so lost and stuck at a young age, which is how I felt when I was young. And I'm also the oldest of five. So I've helped oh, my wow. siblings yeah. figure a lot of that stuff out. And um, I really wish that when I was younger, I, um, I was capable of asking for help. Um, so I think that's probably the the only thing I would have would have changed about um, mm -hmm. things I've done in the past. Um, but I think my my path has been really random and I used to judge myself and I still can very easily get into like a negative spiral where I start judging myself um, mm -hmm. about like not being focused enough or like, am I really this or have I done enough of that and having a lot of the imposter syndrome. But now I see that um, that randomness is is my asset. Like I spent, um, you know, a decade working in nonprofits, doing um, activism, working in, in, in public health and city planning. Um, and uh, but I was always exposed to all of this tech stuff. But as I've moved into working with Forte Labs, I continue to bring my social justice lens and my diversity, equity, inclusion lens and and like all the the work and mindsets I had from the nonprofit world, I bring that into the work we do. And now I have access to certain spaces and people who may not be exposed to the things um, that I know a lot about. Um, and I make sure that I, I continue to, to value those things. Like, for example, we were at a conference recently for all, it was all cryptocurrency founders and Tiago was leading a session there and I tagged along. And while I was there, I made it my point to just connect with people and try to understand their world, but also have them understand my world. And I had this really fascinating conversation with this, guy on um, the housing crisis in the Bay Area and the history of homelessness. And I know a lot of, about that. A lot of my work has been focused mm -hmm. on affordable housing. And then I found out later that this guy was a billionaire. And so I hope I made like some <laughs> impact on him. And so I still bring in no like, all of that into like all the spaces that I that I inhabit. So even though my my pathway has been random and I've done lots of different things. Um, I, I'm excited that I, that I have various interests and opportunities and I give myself space to explore them. And, um, and I, I wouldn't change anything drastically from that, no, that pathway. Definitely. Uh, cause it yeah, did, yeah, I know everything's part of the process, right? You, you, everything, all the experiences help you learn. And, um, and again, to, to echo what you've said, uh, that's why it's important to have a system, right? And so you can capture all those learnings. And uh, I can still go, I can go into my Evernote now and pull out my weekly review from March 2017. And hmm, what happened in March 2017? And I have my weekly review and the five biggest things I accomplished that month each week. Uh, so it's a, that's why having a system is important, right? Because uh, you can actually, what, uh, there's this saying that I live by that, uh, what gets measured gets improved. 
Uh, so you, you need a way of measuring things. So, so no, I, I, I echo your thoughts there. Definitely. Awesome. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at laurenvaldez.com. Um, I have a blog about different things related to productivity, but also a lot of info just related to the issues I care about, like building healthy communities. Um, and then you can also go to fortelabs.co to learn about all of our Forte Labs courses, like the ones you mentioned, getting things done and building a second brain. Um, we have a whole suite of, of online courses as well as things we do in person. Um, so definitely check those things out if you're interested in, in learning more. And we have a ton of free resources as well through our blog on getting these systems set up. The online courses are like the masterclass, the shortcut to getting you there faster, but we have a lot of other content to help you um, move forward on, on setting up these productivity systems. So definitely check that stuff out. Thank you.